So carrying on more with the student as nigger by Jerry Falber. Let's talk about the separate and unequal dining facilities. If I take the between the faculty and the students, so the, he's saying that the faculty have better dining facilities than the students do. Okay, so separate but uh, separate and unequal, just like Plessy versus Ferguson, and probably what Meredith v. Board of Education does, but I have never heard anybody specifically talking about it. Um, the uh, the assignment plan, the school busing assignment plan, that will be an issue because there's a lot of candidates that's running for a school board. Um, it'll be a fun issue to actually explore. So, I take my students into the faculty dining room. My colleagues get uncomfortable as though that there was a bad smell. If I eat in the student cafeteria, I become known as the educational equivalent of a nigger lover. In at least one building, there are at least restrooms which students may not use. At Cal State, also, there is an unwritten law barring student faculty love making. Fortunately, this anti miscegenation law, like its southern counterpart, is not 100% effective. <laughs> Students at Cal State are politically disenfranchised. They are in an academic Lowndes County. Lowndes County, which is 90-95% uh, black during the Black Panther movement with uh, Stokely Carmichael. He went to Lowndes County and tried to get the movement started there. So most of them can vote in national elections. Most students can vote. Average age is about 26, but they've got no voice in the decisions which affect their academic lives. The students are, it is true, allowed to have a toy government of their own. It is a government run for the most part by Uncle Tom's and concerned uh, principally with trivia. The faculty and administrators decide what courses will be offered. The students get to choose their own homecoming queen. Occasionally when student leaders get uppity and rebellious, they're either ignored, put off with trivial concessions, or maneuvered expertly out of position. Smiles and shuffles. A student at Cal State is expected to know his place. He calls a faculty member sir or doctor or professor, and he smiles and shuffles some as he stands outside the professor's office waiting for permission to enter. The faculty tell him what courses to take in my department, English, even electives, have to be approved by a faculty member. They tell him what to read, what to write, and frequently where to set the margins on his typewriter. They tell him what's true and what isn't. Some teachers insist that they encourage dissent, but they're almost always living uh, they're always jiving, and every student knows it. Tell the man what he wants to hear. You'll fall failure ass, ass out of the course. When a teacher says jump, students jump. I know of one professor who refused to take up. Class time for exams. It required students to show up for tests at 6.30 in the morning, and they did, by God. Another at exam time provides answer cards to be filled out, each one enclosed in a paper bag with a hole cut in the top to see through. Students stick their writing hands in the bags while taking the test. The teacher isn't a provo. I wish he were. He does it to prevent cheating. Another colleague putting the whole bags around their hand. I don't get it. Another colleague once caught a student reading during one of his lectures and threw a book against the wall. Still another lectures his students into a stupor and then screams at them in a rage when they fall asleep. Well, just last week during the first meeting of a class, one girl got up to leave after about 10 minutes had gone by. The teacher rushed over, grabbed her by the arm, saying, this class is not dismissed, and led her back to her seat. On the same day, another teacher began by informing his class that he does not like beards, mustaches, long hair on boys, or capri pants on girls, and will not tolerate any of that in his class. The class, incidentally, consisted mostly of high school teachers. Follow orders. Even more discouraging than this Auschwitz, Auschwitz approach to education is the fact that some students take it. They haven't gone through 12 years of public school for nothing. They've learned one thing, and perhaps only one thing, during those 12 years. They've forgotten their algebra. They're hopelessly vague about chemistry and physics. They've grown to fear and resent literature. They write like, they'll be, like they've been lobotomized, but Jesus, can they follow orders? Freshmen come up to me with an essay and ask if I want it folded and whether their name should be in the upper right-hand corner, and I want to cry and kiss them and caress their poor, tortured heads. Students don't ask that orders make sense. They give up expecting things to make sense long before they leave elementary school. Things are true because the teacher says they're true. At a very early age, we all learn to accept two truths, as did certain medieval churchmen. Outside of class, things are true to your tongue, your fingers, your stomach, and your heart. Inside class, things are true by reason of authority. And that's just, uh, that's just fine because you don't care anyways. Miss Wiedemeyer tells you a noun is a person, place, or thing, so let it be. You don't give a rat's ass. She doesn't give a rat's ass. The important thing is to please her. Back in kindergarten, you found out that teachers only 
love children who stand in nice straight lines, and that's where it's been at ever since. Nothing changes except to get worse. School becomes more and more obviously a prison. Last year, spoke out to a, a student assembly at Manual Arts High School, and then couldn't get out of the goddamn school. I mean, there was no way out. Locked doors, high fences. One of the inmates was trying to make it over the fence when he saw me coming, and froze in panic. For a moment, I expected sirens, rattle bullets, and him clawing the fence. Then there's the infamous code of dress. There's a dress code at school, right? Not in, not in uh, college, but always high schools. In some high schools, if your skirt looks too short, you have to kneel before the principal in a brief allegory of fellatio. If the hem doesn't reach the floor, you go home to change while he presumably jacks off. Boys, <laughs> boys in high school can't be too sloppy, and they can't even be too sharp. You'd think the school board would be delighted to see all of the spades trooping to school in pointy shoes, suits, ties, and stingy brims. Uh-uh. They're too visible. What school amounts to, then, for white and black kids alike is a seven-year course on how to be slaves. What else could explain what I see in a freshman class? They've got the slave mentality, obliging and ingratiating on the surface, but hostile and resistant underneath. As do black slave students vary in their awareness of what's going on. Some recognize their own put-on for what it is and even let their rebellion break through to the surface now and then. Others, including most of the good students, have been more deeply brainwashed. They swallowed the bullshit with greed. They, they honest to God, believe in grades, in busy work, in general education requirements. They're pathetically eager to be pushed around. They're like those old gray-headed house niggers you can find in the South who don't see what all the fuss is about because Mr. Charlie, Mr. Charlie treats us real nice. Mr. Master, Mr. Charlie Master treats us nice. College entrance requirements tend to favor the Toms and screen out the Rebels. Not entirely, of course. This is true when it comes to uh, drug charges. If you have a marijuana charge, you cannot get any college loans or um, uh, any monies for college or Pell Grants. It disqualifies you if you have any pot charges. But if you have any heroin or crack or meth or any of the hard, real drugs, Oxycontin charges like Rush Limbaugh, or if you have, you know, doing cocaine like like uh, 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 Barack Obama, you know, not pot, not pot like Obama or, or uh, Bill Clinton, you know, or drinking and driving, you know, that's, that's okay too. So you could be George W. Bush and still go to college. But if you have a pot charge, you're refrained from it. So that's one way that they weed out the rebels. So um, college entrance requirements, right, so the ACT, SAT, not entirely, of course. Some students at Cal State LA are expert con artists who know perfectly well what's happening. They want the degree or the 2S and spend the years on the old plantation alternately, alternately laughing and cursing as they play the game. If their egos are strong enough, they cheat a lot. And of course, even the Toms are angry deep down somewhere, but it comes out in passive rather than active aggression. They're unexplainably thick-witted and subject to frequent spells and laziness. They misread simple questions. They spend their nights mechanically cut outlining history chapters while meticulously failing to comprehend a word of what's in front of them. None are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. Goth. Inward anger. The saddest cases among both black slaves and student slaves are the ones who have so thoroughly interjected their master's values that their anger is still all turned inward. At Cal State, these are the kids for whom every low grade is torture who stammer and shake when they speak to a professor who go through an emotional crisis every time they're called upon during class. You can recognize them easily at finals time. Their faces are festooned with fresh pimples, their bowels, bowels boy audibly across the room. If there really is a last judgment, then the parents and teachers who created these wrecks are going to burn in hell. So, so students are niggers. It's time to find out why and what to do. And to do this, we have to take a long look at Mr. Charlie. What's up with the masses? The teachers I know are best are college professors. Outside the classroom and taken as a group, their most striking characteristic is timidity. They're short on balls. Just look at their working conditions. At a time when even migrant workers have begun to fight and win, college professors are still afraid to make more than a token effort to improve their pitiful economic status in California state colleges. The fa faculties are screwed regularly and vigorously by the governor and legislature, and yet they still won't offer any solid resistance. They lie flat on their stomachs with their pants down, mumbling catchphrases like professional dignity and meaningful dialogue. 
professors are no different when I was an undergraduate at UCLA during the McCarthy era. It was like a cattle stampede as they rushed to cop out. And in more recent years, I found that my friend, that my being arrested in sit-ins brought from my colleagues not so much approval or, or condemnation as open mouth astonishment. You could lose your job. Now, of course, there's the Vietnam, Vietnamese War. It gets some opposition from a few teachers, some support it. But a vast number of professors who know perfectly well what's happening are copping out again. And in the high schools, you can forget it. Stillness reigns. Forces a split. I'm not sure why teachers are so chicken shit. It could be that academic training itself forces a split between thought and action. It might also be that the tenured security of a teaching job attracts timid persons. And furthermore, that teaching like police work pulls in persons who are unsure of themselves and need weapons and the other external trappings of authority. At any rate, teachers are short on balls. And as Judy Eisenstein has eloquently pointed out, the classroom offers an artificial and protected environment in which they can exercise their will to power. Your neighbors may drive a better car, gas station attendants may intimidate you, your wife may dominate you, the state legislature may shit on you, but in the classroom, by God, students do what you say, or else. The grade is a hell of a weapon. It may not rest on your hip, potent and rigid like a cop's gun, but in the long run, it's more powerful. It's your personal whim. Anytime you choose, you can keep 35 students up for nights and have the pleasure of seeing them walk into the classroom, pasty-faced and red-eyed, carrying a sheet typewritten pages with title page MLA footnotes and margins set at 15 and 91. The general timidity which causes teachers to make niggers of their students usually includes a more specific fear. Fear of the students themselves. After all, students are different, just like black people. You stand exposed in front of them knowing that their interests or values and their language are different from yours. To make matters worse, you may suspect that you yourself are not the most engaging of persons. What then can protect you from their ridicule and scorn? Respect for authority? That's what. It's the policeman's gun again, the white Bawana's pith helmet. So you flaunt that authority. You wither whispers with a murderous glance, and you crush objectors with erudation, erudation, and heavy irony. And worst of all, you make your own attainments seem not accessible, but awesomely remote. You conceal your massive ignorance and parade a slender learning. White supremacy. The teacher's fear is mixed with an understandable need to be admired and feel superior, a need which also marks him cling, makes him cling to his white supremacy. Ideally, a teacher should minimize the distance between himself and his students. He should encourage them not to need him uh, eventually or even immediately, but this is rarely the case. Teachers make themselves high priests of arcane mysteries. They become masters of mumbo-jumbo. Even a more or less conscientious teacher may be torn between the desire to give and the desire to hold them in bondage. To him, I can find no other explanation that accounts for the way my own subject literature is generally taught. Literature, which ought to be a source of joy, solace, and enlightenment, often becomes in the classroom nothing more than a source of anxiety. At best, an arena for expertise, a ledger book for the ego. I actually had a person that <laughs> a college student come up tell me that he wasn't going to buy college books. I'm not going to buy college books this year. Nah, I'm not going to buy. Nah, fuck. I don't need the college books this year. I'm just going to repeat whatever the fucking professor says and then I'll get a good grade. Fuck. Fuck reading books. So, so the colleges are actually teaching you the opposite of learning. Uh, by the first, uh, by the time you're in first grade, you're supposed to learn how to read. And then second grade, you are supposed to be learning how to learn uh, by reading. So, kindergarten to first, you learn to read. And then second on, you read to learn. And that's important. That's important to know because if you're not reading, then you're only getting your ideas from a few people you're talking to. That's not enough. That's not enough to make you an own individual and be able to build up your dignity and to have your own person, your own personality, your own ideas. Um, literature teachers, often afraid to join a real union, nonetheless may practice the worst kind of trade unionism in the classroom. They do to literature what Beck Messer does to song in Wagner's Mr. Singer. The avowed purpose of English departments is to teach literature. Too often, their real function is to kill it. Finally, there's the darkest reason of all for the master-slave approach to education. The less trained and less socialized a person is, the more he constitutes a sexual threat and the more he will be subjugated by institutions such as penitentiaries and schools. Many of us are aware by now of the sexual neurosis which makes white men so fearful of integrated schools and neighborhoods and, and which makes the castration of Negroes a deeply entrenched southern folkway. We should recognize a similar pattern in education. There is a kind of castration that goes on in schools. It begins before school years. 
with parents first encroachments on their children's free unashamed sexuality and continues right up to the day when you hand your doctoral diploma with a bleeding shriveled pair of testicles stapled to the parchment. It's not that sexuality it's not that sexuality has no place in the classroom. You'll find it there, but only in certain perverted and vitiated forms. Occupy Louisville, viva la revolution.